Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marwan Masher. I'm the Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, supervising the Middle East program. Today, we have a very interesting session on the one-state reality versus a two-state solution uh, in Israel-Palestine. For almost a quarter century, the two-state solution has been at the center of international policy towards Israel and Palestine. But realities on the ground today seem to suggest otherwise. There is, There has not been a political process of negotiations for the last nine or ten years. Demographically, we have 750,000 settlers in uh, East Jerusalem and the West Bank, suggesting that the separation of the two communities has become difficult, if not impossible. And today, many uh, scholars are arguing that uh, the two-state solution is no longer possible and that we are in a one-state reality, even if this reality is not a democratic one. So, are new approaches necessary? Uh, should one stick to the two-state solution or are there, uh, are there new approaches to solving uh, this elusive uh, problem and conflict? To discuss this issue, we have today with us four distinguished speakers. Nathan Brown is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, is the co-author of a recent book called The One State Reality, as well as a recent piece in foreign affairs arguing uh, the same. Diana Butto is a Palestine-based lawyer and analyst. She's a frequent commentator on Palestine and a former legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiations team. Lucy Kurtzer Ellenbogen is the director of the Israel, Palestinian Territories and the Region Program at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And Michael Koplo is the chief policy officer of the Israeli Policy Forum and a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. So with that introduction, I uh, want to start with you, Nathan. Nathan, can you lay out what you and your co-authors argued with in your both recent book and recent foreign affairs piece? And why did you all decide to write it at this moment? And perhaps in the process, talk about some of the reactions to your piece, because I know there have been many. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marwan. Um, essentially, the argument of the, of, the, of the piece, I think, sort of three parts. Uh, number one, there's simply one state reality. There's the state of Israel that controls all the territory of mandatory Palestine. Um, and second, that the two state, as two state solution, a two state outcome to resolve the national conflict between Israelis and Palestinians was viable at an earlier point. Um, none of the authors were against the, the uh, two states in principle, but it's simply not viable now. And even more than that, talk about it. And, and focusing on the two-state solution is actually damaging because it distracts uh, uh, from what's really happening on the ground. And then there were some um, policy implications we were trying to draw out. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is a reality. The one-state reality is not a solution. It's not a just outcome. And so we sort of talked about how it was in the international community the United States should deal with um, an emerging um, a deeply unjust and problematic uh, reality. So um, the four authors are different, uh, but we agreed on, on every word and every sentence in the article. And um, the, 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 the essentially, the reactions are kind of interesting. I think sort of there's quiet reactions. Um, that we get in personal conversations, sometimes in, in quieter public events, and that is, you're right, especially on the first, there's a one-state reality. There's not a lot of contestation um, about that. Um, but we we do get some sharp reactions, and I'm trying to understand the reasons for this, because in a sense, what we're saying is what lots of people have been saying, including some of us, the authors, for a long time. So why does this provoke uh, such a strong reaction? And quite honestly, I'll, uh, I, I may sound a little cynical here. It's not because we're brilliant or we're in front of everybody else. In some ways, we're behind other people. Um, but you've got you know, four middle-aged nerdy guys saying this in Foreign Affairs, a stodgy publication. That's what gets attention. Um, so it's almost... The fact that it is becoming boring, uh, a boring truism, um, that that 
and and the policy implications of that are would, would are disturbing for all kinds of uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I think that's one reason we get the sharp reaction. Interestingly, most of those reactions don't uh, focus on the analysis, the analytical realities. They focus on the prescriptions. Um, and sometimes, and I'll, I'll be frank here, it's a little bit distressing, sometimes they focus on the person. They're sort of, you know, what are your real motives? Why are you doing this? Um, what you're really trying to do is this, that you're really uh, uh, trying to destroy Israel, you're trying to do this or that or the other thing. Um, so those have been some of the reactions. But I want to go back to that quiet one. We have a phrase in, in, in the article, I don't remember which of the four co-authors came up with it, uh, from the unspeakable to the undeniable. And I think that's where we are with the one state reality. What was something that everybody knew, uh, including policymakers, but didn't want to say, is now kind of the beginning point for, for discussions. It's become the received wisdom. Thank you. Uh, perhaps we will ha li listen to a different point of view from Michael. Uh, Michael, more than 10 years ago, in 2012, two of the main articles of the Oslo peace process called the two-state solution and the Oslo framework dead. So Ahmed Korea and Yossi Valen, two uh, main architects of the Oslo process, uh, both uh, felt 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, that the process uh, is dead. You recently were, sorry, that the two-state solution is dead. You recently wrote that you have little dispute with their description of the situation as it exists. Your disagreement is with the prescription which you believe aims for citizenship for all Israelis and Palestinians in a single state. Uh, many of the architects of the peace process, including Yossi Bilal and Ahmed Khariya, came to believe that this had run its course. If there is no viable process that can produce a two-state solution, why should it, why should it uh, be a goal uh, anymore? Thanks, Marwan. Um, so, as you uh, as you point out, I um, I think that Nathan is is 100% correct in describing the current situation on the ground in in Israel Palestine. Um, you know, I, there there is no question to me that at the moment Israel controls all of Israel inside the Green Line and, and the West Bank thoroughly. Um, and to, to to talk about Palestinian authority, autonomy, or, or, or sovereignty, I think, is, um, is is incorrect. There's certainly, you know, limited PA autonomy in some spots, um, but even in those spots, it's routinely violated. So, talking about a one-state reality to me is not uh, is 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 not and should not in any way be controversial, nor is it wrong. Um, where I differ is that, um, and I may be I may be the last one to leave the room here, but uh, where I differ is that. I don't think that two states uh, is no longer viable. I think that we are in likely the darkest period that we have been. Um, some of that is the current Israeli government, which is doing things that are literally unprecedented when it comes to the situation in the West Bank. But it is certainly not all because of the current Israeli government. Uh, I think that um, when, when, when anyone was saying 10 years ago, that two states was difficult to envision. It was because of policies of successive Israeli governments, um, all of whom, including ones from the left, built inside the West Bank, um, did what they could to erode the Palestinian Authority, uh, did what they could to ensure the current one state reality that we see. Um, but from my point of view, when you look at the numbers and when you look at where there are Israelis inside of the West Bank, there is still a way to get separation and get to two states. Um, you know, when th there are about 100,000 Israelis living over the Green Line, roughly are on about 3.9% of the territory that's all attached to the Green Line. Um, that still leaves a lot of Israelis who are living deep into the West Bank uh, in very small settlements. And those small settlements are growing in number, particularly because the Israeli government is, is turning a blind eye to things like illegal outposts that are purposely being placed in spots deep inside the West Bank, purposely being placed in spots that disrupt Palestinian contiguity. Um, those are things that are going to have to be dealt with. And I think that anybody who portrays that as an easy task um, is vastly underestimating what it's going to take um, to actually get to a two-state outcome. But I don't think that we're at the point of no return. 
Um, and I also worry when it comes to U.S. policy that if we shift and we start not only acknowledging the current one state reality, um, but dropping any pretense to trying to get to separation and to two states, we're going to end up with a situation that is in some ways going to be worse than what we have now. Um, if there's anything of which I'm confident and I spend lots of time talking to Israelis and I spend lots of time in Israel, um, it is that Israelis are not to give up Israel as a Jewish state. And I worry that if we shift to a, a policy of, of one state, um, it's going to lead to ultimately more bloodshed. Um, it's going to lead to things that are even uglier than what we see on the ground now. Um, and at the end of that process, we may end up back where we are trying to separate the two sides. And so I prefer to do what we can. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll talk about what that might be. Um, I, I prefer to do what we can to try to get two states back on track, um, certainly to take a tougher line with the Israeli government, um, do what we can to stop the situation that has created this one state reality um, and figure out if two states is still salvageable, which, as I said, from my perspective, it still is, but it's certainly not going to be forever. Okay, moving to Diana. Um, when Oslo assigned Diana and uh, linking in what Michael just said, the number of settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem was around 250,000. Yeah. 30 years later, they are around 750,000. So the numbers are daunting. Uh, Michael uh, still believes we can separate the two communities. Uh, many argue that we cannot. You have been an early critic of Oslo and the two-state solution after having spent a good part of your career engaged in Palestinian-Israeli negotiators as a legal advisor. You're probably in the same uh, position I was uh, with the Jordanian government. So yeah. when was the moment you came to feel not only that the exercise was going nowhere, but that it was important to say so publicly. And why do you think policymakers are refusing to think beyond the two-state solution? Uh, thank you, Marwan. Uh, thank you for, for hosting this. And thank you, Nathan, for the excellent piece that, that you've written. And I want to thank all the panelists uh, for being here today as well. Oh, when did I, when did I have the about face? Look, um, I, I, there, I had two different, there were two different moments in time for me where, where I saw what the reality on the ground was and how much that differed from, from the political speak, so to speak. Uh, one time was in the early 90s, immediately after the signing of Oslo, I was very much like Michael, where I believed that it was just a question of getting the right agreement and, uh, and that we just needed to sign this right agreement um, to, to get the settlers out and there would be, there would be a, an agreement, you know, there would be a peace agreement. And so my, my, first, um, my first inclination was very unfortunately, and, and I say this with, with all humility, um, that I was somebody who didn't agree with Edward Said. I thought that Edward Said was, uh, I arrogantly uh, thought that Edward Said was somebody who was wrong. And, and it was really in the 90s, in the, in the late 90s, that I began to see that he was right. But the, but the real test for me, the real moment of truth came in, during the negotiations at Taba, when during the negotiations at Taba, the Israeli negotiators made clear that this was all about them rewarding Israel for very bad behavior, meaning all of the settlement construction, and that Palestinians just had to to you know, to suck it up, so to speak, um, and so that that moment came a little bit later for me. So between the, the late '90s and then at the end of the Taba Agreement, there were uh, a few years that that happened. But now, when I look back, Marwan, um, and I look at, at at what happened in Israeli history and what happened during the negotiations and during this peace process and so on, I realized that the two-state solution was actually dead in 1967. And I say this because there was political will to remove the settlers in 1967 when the first settlements went up. And they, they instead of using that political capital, 
they ended up squandering it. And we now see a settler movement that is stronger than any movement we see inside Israel. In fact, the settlement block is the largest block. It's the largest voting block that we now see within the government. So if there was an opportunity, it died very quickly in 1967, and that opportunity has not existed. Why is it that people keep clinging to it? This is the million-dollar question. I think it's, um, I don't have the million-dollar answer, but I have a, a few things that I, that I can think of. One is that we still have a Palestinian authority that, that flies around and pretends that it's president. And for as long as he keeps calling himself president and keeps waving a flag, um, the international community is going to continue to cling on to that. But the moment that that stops, I think that one, we might see a change in policy. Another reason is because it's in Israel's interest to continue to prop up the Palestinian Authority. They've said as much. They've done as much just this past week by saying that they don't want it to collapse. And I think internationally, the world community um, doesn't want to expend any political capital when it comes to holding Israel to account. So I think the, the reasons are, are many, um, but the tragedy is, is that we're at a point now where you, as, I would, as I've said before, and I said this many, many years ago, you can't unscramble an egg. And instead of trying to think of ways of, of separation as uh, people keep trying to do, I think we really have to focus on ending this apartheid regime that exists from the river to the sea. Okay. Uh... By the way, I want to remind people who want to ask questions to send their questions to the chat box, uh, and I hope we will have time to answer at least some of them. So, Lucy, uh, Diana introduces a very radical uh, idea that the two-state solution actually was dead in '67. that uh, we didn't need to wait uh, 40 years to, to declare its death. You have uh, been working at the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, spending, uh, spending a large part of your career uh, towards uh, a two-state solution. I did that as well. Uh, would recognizing uh, a one-state reality uh, necessitate an end to the kind of peace-making uh, work that you and most of the international community have been involved in? How would, how would our work have to change if we start operating under the assumption that the two-state solution now is inoperable and the reality on the ground needs to be addressed, how, how, would, you, uh, how would you answer that? Yeah, thank you, Marwan, and, and also a word of thanks to you and to Carnegie for hosting and, and, and co-panelists for, for an interesting discussion, and Nathan for, for generating with your co-authors this important discussion and debate. I, I would just note uh, maybe a slight modification to what you were saying, Marwan, is that I, no, Certainly from, from, a, from a perspective of, say, the U.S. Institute of Peace, from a perspective of uh, a quest for peace and conflict resolution, the end goal is what would be um, a sustainable, peaceful resolution to the situation. And I think there has been, as just discussed with Diana, there had been a consensus for a long time, and not just in U.S. policy circles, but I think internationally, and there was a point at which both parties brought in to this notion that the two-state solution would be the way to achieve that sustainable goal. And I think, I would just add on, I think Diana put out a number of reasons why it's a, the solution that won't die, why it keeps capturing the imagination or sort of won't, won't go away easily. And I would suggest uh, some of that is, is not just for the reasons uh, that Diana mentioned. I think there definitely are entrenched interests. I think there have certainly been cynics who have used the process that has been, um, implemented to try to get there as, as a get out of making tough compromises free card and you know pursuing maximalist goals. But I also think it captured the imagination because I think even going back to the original petition plan, there was a sense uh, among many that having these two sizable populations trying to live in any other way, uh, who, who deeply, deeply dislike and distrust each other, trying to achieve a sustainable nonviolent solution without some form of separation in the form of two states. I think that was, it was just seen um, as, as no other possible route to or, or prescription for a sustainable peace. Um, and I think that you still see, so again, I think put aside the, the, the simple reasons for it, I think that people are still having a hard time thinking 
about what the alternatives that St. Nathan is laying out would be the alternatives, how that's any more feasible at this point, as difficult as I think we all agree here today that getting to two states is. I haven't yet heard an answer in this debate writ large, not just in this discussion of how we get to what would be a prescription for peace, which I think the, the authors, I think Nathan, you and your co-authors laid out either in the original piece or the response, that there's only two ways that you can think of to where equality of rights for both would be achieved, either two states or a binational equal rights uh, state. Um, and to me, when I think of what the feasibility would be of one over the other, for many of the reasons laid out, uh, I'm still stuck on that proposition. What I would say is I do think that the onus now is on the parties to articulate in a fulsome way their end game vision and not just their vision, right? We, I think Diana just mentioned that Netanyahu has said in the last couple of weeks, we, we need to you know, quash any aspiration for Palestinian state and we need to make sure that we, we, we prop up a strengthened or strengthen or embolden the Palestinian Authority. That certainly wouldn't embolden them or strengthen them with their own people. Um, but I think now the onus is on the parties to say, okay, what is your end game vision of where that leads? And what is your understanding of the consequences, trade-offs and paths to getting there? And I mean consequences and trade-offs for your own interests. Um, and I think that's what we're not seeing. I think the parties being called to account at this point, people, this term political horizon is used a lot so that we've lost the political horizon. And I think at the end of the day, that is true. I think we have the US and other actors, including, I don't want to talk about the Arab Peace Initiative with you, Moan, you know more than anyone, but I have found it interesting that with this death, as it were, of the Arab Peace Initiative with the advent of the Abraham Accords, I have not seen a death of the articulation of the goal in the Arab Peace Initiative. I think those countries are still saying that two states um, is their goal for some of the reasons and many of the reasons we've just talked about. But I think that we need to get to the point where we're, we're not just saying what the political horizon is um, and not calling the parties to account to express why, if that's not their goal, what the alternative is um, and, and what that means uh, for the future. I want to come back to you, Nathan, uh, building on what Lucy just said. So Lucy says that all the alternatives are worse, and uh, there is no point in a bad alternative, a binational state, a one-state solution that seems equally, if not uh, more, uh, uh, un un uh, untenable. Uh, Many people have, including yourself, called for equal civil and political rights and human rights for all uh, in the areas under Israel's control, regardless of uh, the shape of the solution, whether it's one state or two states. And I think many agree that the shape of the solution today is, uh, is very difficult to imagine. Uh, we have seen uh, today, we witness uh, uh, youth movement in uh, in uh, uh, in the occupied territories that I have called a third intifada, but an intifada without leadership. Uh, every four or five people getting together and uh, engaging in violent acts for no uh, uh, for no defined political end. It's just a, a way of frustration uh, of what is going on and. Uh, I'm afraid that might even, uh, you know, increase in the future. But most of those critical for uh, this call for equal civil and uh, human rights for all have seen this as a call to end Jewish self-determination. Uh, nothing is being said about Palestinian self-determination, of course, but uh, that's how they've seen it. Why do you think the piece is being read this way? And, and what policy recommendations do you have for the U.S. to get to equal rights for all, no matter what the shape of a solution is, whether it's one state or one state or two states. Um, that that um, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I think we are read that way, um, and I think we're read that way for a couple reasons. Um, as essentially calling for a, a, a one-state solution. We have no objection to a one-state solution. We have no objection to a two-state solution. But I think we're read that way. Um, in part because we're not offering a viable path. I mean, in a sense, 
everything that Lucy just said about how to get to these various paths, that, that's what, what, what we're agreeing with. So, so not being able to point to any kind of, of, of viable process that will lead to some kind of permanent resolution, peaceful resolution of this conflict. Um, we read that way. That's sort of a good faith reading of, 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 of the article. I honestly think there's a bad faith reason as well. As I say, the policy implications of what we're saying are ones that people have tried not to deal with. Um, and so disqualify the messengers rather than uh, rather, rather than the message. I think there is some of that going on in 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 in, in uh, public discussion. Um, 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 the quiet discussions that I mentioned are very very different. Um, they're much more like more like the tone of the discussion that that that, that we're having right now. And I'm uh, very grateful to my uh, co-panelists actually, um, partly uh, for that for sort of engaging with the serious issues. Um, in terms of policy recommendations, you know I. Again, I don't disagree with anything that um, actually that anybody has said uh, um, at this point, even though people who are disagreeing with me, I agree with. Um, um, yeah, a two state solution, Michael, I think is right, is uh, is is would, would would it wouldn't be perfect outcome, but it would be it would be a possible one. Um, but I go back to Lucy's point about look, all roads. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put it slightly more uh, modelly than she did. All roads are blocked. So starting off by asking what is the ideal outcome and how do we get there is probably going to lead us to spinning our, continuing to spin our wheels. Let's start instead with realities on the ground and let's start instead with some kind of sense that everybody involved, all individuals and all peoples have rights um, and measure policy by that yardstick. So this is not a solution any any permanent solution would have to respect those rights. This is a yardstick by which to, to, to judge policies. Is it treating people? Um, is is it improving the situation on the ground for real people, even short term? Um, when you talk about a two state solution, and as we have the siege of Gaza, which has gone on now for just an inhumanely long period of time, kind of disappears into the background. We'll deal with Gaza later. We'll negotiate two states. Um, and then we'll deal with Gaza. Put that on the front burner. Address the 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 the, the ongoing humanitarian disaster in Gaza, um, um, and start 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 policy from there. There are other implications. I think um, one one is um, uh, you know, Diana used a very tough word, and it's a word I have trouble pronouncing, not because it's hard to say, but for emotional reasons, she used the word apartheid. If you take this one state reality. Seriously, if you listen to the statements of current Israeli leaders, Prime Minister Netanyahu is on the left wing of his government, and those who are on the right wing, they are talking about a situation that seems to me to qualify um, as apartheid. Um, and up till now, the response of the United States has been, well, with apartheid, no, we don't believe it's apartheid. But generally, when you start talking about international legal instruments, we talk about Geneva Conventions and so on, the idea has been, wait, that distracts from diplomacy. This has to take place in the realm of diplomacy. And, um, and there is no diplomacy now. So stop doing that. Stop exempting this issue from the, all the uh, 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 international standards and structures that the United States helped construct after uh, World War II of an, of an order, of an international order that was respectful of, of, of human rights. St start exempting. Stop vetoing UN Security Council resolutions. Stop saying Geneva Conventions are somehow um, uh, uh, not relevant to this. Those are the sorts of policy implications. Um, and I would say, um, 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 based on what, uh, what, what, what Lucy said, yeah, this is not going to lead to a solution uh, anytime soon. I don't think there will be a solution. I don't think I will live to see a solution. I'm, I'm just hoping my grandchildren will be, and the standard that I'm uh, 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 articulating is one that I hope would lead a future generation in a better position to negotiate a just and peaceful outcome. So, Michael, Diana has used the word apartheid. It's a word that, uh, you know, was taboo uh, five years ago. It is no longer taboo, and a lot of people have used it a lot of human rights and organizations, including Beit But I want you to imagine a scenario in 2033, 
10 years from now. And the possibility of a two-state solution, even then, 10 years from now, I think you would argue, is, is pretty remote. There, is, there hasn't been a political process uh, for the last 10 years. The number of Palestinian uh, Arabs today in areas under Israel's control is slightly, slightly bigger than the number of Israeli Jews. So we already have a situation in which a minority is ruling over a majority in, if I don't want to say apartheid manner, in less than a democratic way. And the issue of rights is becoming center stage now uh, throughout the world. How would you see the situation on the ground in Israel-Palestine 10 years from now? If a minority is ruling over a majority, if there is no two-state solution and no equal rights for Palestinians and Israelis, how do you, would you describe the situation in Israel-Palestine? How do you think the Jewish-American community would react 10 years from now. We are already seeing uh, polls that suggest that the American Jewish community prefer a democratic Israel to a Jewish Israel. How, how would you uh, describe the situation in your view 10 years from now? So I, I don't have a crystal ball, so you know I don't know what will be 10 years from now, but, but I can certainly address the, the underlying issues. Um, if Israel continues along the path that it is going on, um, it's hard for me to see Israel remaining democratic. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think it's important for the United States to keep on focusing on two states is to keep Israel in the democratic camp. There are, there are you know, Nathan is, is correct in pointing out that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu um, is on the left of his coalition. Um, you know, I'd argue that he's been on the left of his coalition for almost a decade, um, you know, but now, now it's even more stark. Um, you know, he, he, of course, himself has moved even farther to the right, but his partners have moved all that more to the right. Um, and my concern is that if the United States or other countries start talking about a single state, um, that is going to give fuel to the Israeli right to do uh, things such as formally annexing the West Bank and not giving Palestinians their citizenship. Um, because what they will say is, all right, the, the rest of the world is saying is saying one state, so we're going to implement the one state. Um, and you know, I think that if we get to one state in Israel-Palestine, it's going to be the right wing, the Israeli right wing vision of one state. That's not acceptable to me. Um, it's certainly not acceptable to the overwhelming majority of American Jews. Um, you know, Marwan, you are correct in pointing out that American Jews support Israel as a democracy, first and foremost. Um, and so we should be holding Israel's feet to the fire to uphold those commitments. Um, you know, yesterday there was there was a vote in the House uh, where only nine people, um, only nine people voted against the proposition uh, that that Israel is a is, is not a racist or apartheid state. That's the state of affairs in U.S. in U.S. politics. Um, I think that it's unlikely that this U.S. government or any U.S. government is going to push for a version of one state in Israel-Palestine where everybody has complete citizenship. Um, and so I want to avoid a situation where we get to an Israeli right-wing version of one state. And um, reorienting U.S. policy away from two states, I think, is going to lead to that very quickly. Um, the American Jewish community, I, I would argue, should be doing a better job um, of pushing both the U.S. government and the Israelis on getting to a situation where Palestinians can have their absolutely legitimate national aspirations respected, where Palestinians can have rights, where Palestinians are not living under occupation. Uh, you know, Nathan listed a number of things with which I agree, and I don't think that they require a reorientation away from two states. Um, the Trump administration is the only administration since 1967 that did not use either uh, an abstention or, or, or a positive vote uh, for a UN Security Council resolution uh, targeting Israel over its policies in the West Bank. Um, we don't have to we don't have to reorient around one state to start uh, to start changing our policy in the UN. I shouldn't say shouldn't say change because again, the Trump administration is the only one that never used it. Um, I think that. Uh, People underestimate 
the political benefits to not only Prime Minister Netanyahu, but to all sorts of other Israeli officials um, in in visits here. Uh, I, I will say that um, I am I'm dismayed at the reporting that President Biden invited Prime Minister Netanyahu to meet somewhere in the United States. I suspect it won't be an, op- an Oval Office meeting, but you know, a meeting at the UN as well. I think, given everything going on, uh, doesn't necessarily send the right signal right now. Um, and I would frankly extend that policy to other folks in the Israeli government as well, who also have uh, power over what takes place in the West Bank. Um, I think that there are ways in which you, the U.S. can be more effective in persuading the Israelis to shift course um, in the direction of two states that doesn't require necessarily upending uh, where the U.S. wants to th- wants to see things going. So um, am I am I happy with with what's going on now? Um, U.S. policy, right? Now? I'm not. Um, but I think that there's a way to shift those things and still keep a two state framework. When uh, we talk about uh, a one-state solution, not reality, but a solution, people uh, assume that it's the liberal view of one state, which means one person, one vote formula, which, of course, is something that Israel will never forget. But Sam Bahur and others remind me that this is not the only uh, solution. Uh, 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 to one state. Uh, There are many other solutions, a federal arrangement, a confederation, where each community gets equal rights within their own sort of entity and where they have common maybe foreign policy or security policy or what have you. Diana, you have been uh, engaged in uh, a one democratic state campaign. You call it the one democratic state. And you're a founding member of that. Uh, can you tell us more about your vision uh, about a one-state solution? Does it, uh, uh, is, it, is, it, is it a solution that can meet the demands of both communities uh, and achieve both self, uh, Palestinian self-determination and uh, uh, Jewish self-determination? What has the reception been like for it in, 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 in Israel? where a majority of Palestinian citizens still say they support a two-state solution, although you've been telling me that the situation is changing on the ground Mm -hmm. uh, lately. So uh, can you tell us more about uh, such activities? Yes, I'm happy to. So I think it's important to step back a second and to ask ourselves why there isn't this two-state solution if there's such a, a desire for it. Um, And the reason is, is that if there was going to be a two-state solution, it would have happened by now. If this was a question about drawing a line and drawing a boundary, a line or a boundary would have been drawn by now. That that would have happened decades ago. It would have happened during the period that I was involved in negotiations. But that's not the issue. And, and, and um, And it's important to highlight that that's not the issue. The issues that Palestinians are focused on is the Nakba and the creation of the state of Israel on the backs of Palestinians on our land by expelling us, by ethnically cleansing us from our homeland. And so it's only when you start looking at the issue from the perspective of the Nakba and from the people who've survived the Nakba or who've suffered from the Nakba that you can begin to understand any of these so-called solutions or any of the ways forward because those are the people who must be centered. It's those voices, those people who've suffered, who must be centered in all of this. And so talking about the One Democratic State campaign, um, the the campaign takes uh, off from from a a couple of standpoints. And the first standpoint is that there are millions of Palestinians who are living under Israeli military occupation. And the second standpoint is that there are close to 2 million Palestinians who are living under Israeli rule, but not as equal citizens. I'm one of them. I I hold Israeli citizenship, but I'm not an equal citizen. The laws are not equally applied to me as they are to other Israeli citizens. I'm discriminated against directly and indirectly in the form of law. And the third is the, the issue of Palestinian refugees. When you look at you, you, uh, more than 50% of Palestinians live outside of the boundaries of historic Palestine. That's huge brain capital. And so the one democratic state is, is focused on 
on, on bringing people back. It's focused on righting the wrongs. It's focused on ending occupation. And it's focused on ending that system of discrimination and of privilege that exists from the river to the sea. What has the reception been? It's been mixed. Um, interestingly, the reception has been, it is, is mixed because, mostly because, especially in the West Bank, Palestinians are now at the point where they're saying two state, one state, it's all sort of irrelevant at this point. It's like you could be talking about living on the moon or reaching the moon sooner than you can talk or, or living on the sooner than you can talk about this idea of states. And so for them, it's, it's kind of the furthest thing that they're thinking about. Instead, they're talking about the day to day. How do we decolonize? How do we get these settlers out of our midst? How do we get the army out of our out of our way? How do we begin to live a normal life? And so the reception has been mixed. On the theoretical level, yes, people are supportive on both sides, by the way, of the green line, both among Israeli citizens and among Palestinians. The problem is, is that there needs to be an entry point to get to that. And all of this talk of two state, one state has been, I have to say, quite a distraction for Palestinians who are struggling on a daily basis just to be able to survive. And they implore us all the time. I mean, the people are imploring me say, let's focus on, on our actual reality, what it's like to live as a Palestinian suffering under a brutal siege in Gaza. What is, what's it like to live as a Palestinian who's living behind the wall or living in a camp or living uh, in the West Bank somewhere who doesn't have freedom of movement, doesn't have any prospects for a future. Let's talk about what it's like to be a Palestinian who holds Israeli citizenship, who has laws that dis directly discriminate against them. And so it's those elements that must be addressed rather than this theoretical framework that, uh, that quite frankly, the only people who are really talking about today are people in, in the United States. Um, and I just wanna add one thing. You know, the settler movement is not waiting for the United States to give it permission. They never have. They never will. They do what they do because they can. And if anything, there should be the brakes that are put on this movement. If people truly believe in the idea of equality and of rights, whether it's in the two framework of two states or in the framework of one state, we have yet to see that anybody has put the brakes on Israel. Instead, it's become very permissive. Lucy, thank you, Diana. That is, is uh, bringing up an important point, which is that policymakers seem to be stuck with the shape of a solution, while realities on the ground are different. People want, you know, to be treated uh, equally. They want uh, their human rights to be respected. They want to be able to live a normal life. And this talk about... Uh, you know, the shape of a solution takes place in the international community in the absence of any real political process to make it happen. So for the last 10 years, we have not had a political process while settlement activity has uh, mushroomed, uh, has increased, and the status quo has not been held static. Uh, mm -hmm. I often uh, joke uh, that it is similar to a situation where two people are arguing over a slice of pizza while one of them is eating it. It just doesn't work anymore, a lot of critics say. Uh, you guys are stuck in the past talking about a two-state solution framework when reality on the ground suggests different. Today, President Herzog of Israel, as we speak, is addressing a joint session of Congress. What do you think President Biden will tell uh, President Herzog? Do you believe, Lucy, that there is any uh, real opportunity of the United States taking a serious uh, uh, attempt again to move the peace process forward? Are they going to be stuck with the issue of two states? Uh, uh, or is the president, you know, uh, soon to have a major presidential campaign and this whole issue is... Uh, you know, just going to give him headaches that he does not need. Uh, uh, what is the significance of President Herzog's visit, and what do you think the U.S. will tell him? Look, I think we've heard some of what Biden uh, will be telling him. I mean, we've heard uh, President Biden be 
in relative terms, uh, vocal, primarily for a long time, vocal pushing back on the uh, proposed judicial reforms. Um, and recently, uh, you've heard more emphasis, in fact, I think Michael recently wrote about this, more emphasis from Biden on connecting the concern over the direction of Israeli democracy, not just to the judicial reform, but also reflecting on what is happening in the West Bank uh, with the extremists in Netanyahu's coalition, uh, the unchecked um, settlement growth, a march away from two states. So you have heard Biden express those concerns, those pushback, that pushback in public, and I'm sure that that is going to be uh, the messaging again today. You raised another point in there, uh, Marwando, you raised another question of, do we see this administration going back to a political process? And in some ways, I think you answered the question yourself. I think there's a cost-benefit calculation, not just on the part of the US administration, but I think on other international actors that we've seen over the last few years. I think there's a lot of uh, distraction with other international issues, a lot of reprioritization, and a lot of that reprioritization has come not just from these other issues that are taking precedence, but a sense that no good can come of this, that negotiations aren't feasible at this point, an assessment, I think you see this again by the US, the Europeans, and the Arab parties as well, that the leadership on both sides are not in a position to come to a negotiating table um, and, and forge a successful solution. So I think you are not going to see, and, and yes, the political calendar um, also plays into that. When you're looking at going for broke, I think the Biden, if you think about Biden and a lot of the people around him coming out of the administration, the, uh, the uh, Obama administration that did try um, and um, got burnt. And an administration that tried, and if we recall, ended with Secretary Kerry at the time, standing all sorts of warnings about what would happen um, and what the trajectory and the vision was if um, a solution wasn't achieved. Um, and I think uh, the calculation of this administration has been, there is not, um, th this is an effort not worth pushing right now. Um, also because the leaders aren't in position to do that. But I'd like to get back to a point that uh, Diana made in talking about uh, one of the, the proposals she's been working on. And what Diana's been pointing to really here is a civil society ground up conversation. I said in my earlier comments that I think it's on, the onus is on the parties to articulate what the vision is uh, if it's no longer uh, two states and their understanding of what trade-offs they are making for their own futures and articulating that vision. And I recognize in expressing that, I think the implication was that that's the parties, the elites, the leaders. But I think that this is a conversation um, for the publics to have as well. If you look at polling, and Israelis and Palestinians have been exhaustively polled, um, at, at the younger generations, the visions are very much changing. The views are very much different than at the parents' and grandparents' generation. We did a few years ago um, in, in 2020 in a, a partnership with the Alliance for Middle East Peace, uh, USIT poll, USIP polled youth, 15 to 21-year-olds, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and the results were rather sobering. We're actually, we're, we're doing a, a round two um, uh, of that just to see where things have moved since then. But at this youngest age cohort, um, the rejection by both sides of um, the sense that the other side has any connection or legitimate historical connection to the land. Um, majorities on both sides were sort of denying that about the other. Um, the, the picture about neither side believed certainly that two states was feasible anytime soon, but there was also a sense on both sides to varying degrees that force was the only way that was going to force the other side to make a concession. This is a, this is a very sobering uh, reality of this is where the attitudes are at the younger generation. And I think deep conversations, I think I think you're right. I think Israelis and Palestinians, particularly the younger generation, feel that all these policy conversations are so detached from what's actually happening in their reality on the ground. And so I think there is an onus as well, and that's the work of civil society. And there are groups um, that are that are sort of doing that kind of work, trying to have bring Israelis together in conversations with themselves, Palestinians in conversations with themselves, and ideally eventually uh, with each other. Um, it, it may sound uh, naive, particularly to bring together with each other, but this is where this future vision um, is going to be articulated. I noted there was a question, I think, from uh, Sam Bahor about confederation. 
Um, this is another one of those uh, ideas that's out on the table, as Nathan knows, this is something else we're looking at at USIP. What does this idea of confederation I mean? Uh, to my mind, I, I'm not sure how you get to a confederation without first confederating two states. You need to have sort of two states willingly decide to enter into a confederation with each other. But that willingness is going to come from some real uh, hard questions being asked by the publics themselves. Um, either pushing their leaders if their leaders aren't pushing them in, in that direction. Uh, what what does this future look like and what are you both willing uh, to bear in relation to living with each other? I want to uh, wrap up uh, a set of questions which we have and ask you all to comment on them. Uh, they're all important questions and they have to do with the democracy issue. So people are saying, you know, how can we have a viable political process when we a lot will argue don't have a democratic Israel. Israel is, used to be a democracy for its Jewish citizens. Now even that uh, is not true anymore. And when we don't have a democratic PA, uh, the last time we had elections was in 2006 or seven, <clears throat> and the PA has, has practically lost all its legitimacy since then. So how can we have a viable uh, political process in the absence? of these elements and how can civil society that Lucy talk about uh, how can they uh, you know play uh, a bigger role when they are facing restrictions and smear campaigns in the US and abroad uh, uh, how do you address the, the shrinking civil space issue also uh, all and I, I'll invite maybe uh, uh, all of you to answer this question and any other comment you might have uh, uh, in the interest of time, we have eight minutes left, so maybe we can devote uh, two minutes uh, to each of you. Who wants to start? Michael, do you want to go ahead? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to go ahead. There's no question to me that, um, you know, we've, we've been talking about, uh, obviously, the, uh, the problems on the Israeli side. There, there, of course, is no question to me that there are deep problems on the Palestinian side as well. Um, and the Palestinian Authority, frankly, is one of them. Um, you know, I, I think it is important for the United States to do what it can to strengthen the Palestinian Authority, simply because it is the only, the only element at the moment in the West Bank that has any semblance of functioning institutions. Uh, and I think that if the PA were to collapse tomorrow, you would have anarchy and, and that would not that would certainly not be a good situation uh, for Palestinians living in the West Bank. Um, that said, the Palestinian Authority uh, is not in any way democratic. You know, in my own conversations with PA officials, um, I, I tend to find that instead of elections, they talk about establishing legitimacy through through PLO consensus. And um, to me, that doesn't fly. And I don't think that flies for many Palestinians either. I think that the PA absolutely should uh, should undertake a real series of reforms. I think the Palestinians absolutely need to have elections. Um, some of that, you know, some of that is on Israel, but certainly not all of it is on Israel. Um, and I also think that without elections, it's going to be impossible to have a single Palestinian actor. Um, the problem of the split between Fatah and Hamas and the West Bank and Gaza is a real issue, um, not only for the, the lived lives of Palestinians, but for any type of coherent single policy, um, and certainly for a single coherent Palestinian policy that's able to deal with Israel, the United States, and other international actors. So um, I think that you know all of that has to happen, um, and I, I think that uh, if 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 I were uh, if I were directing if I were directing policy uh, and or Israeli policy, I would be working to figure out how to have elections both in the West Bank and Gaza um, in a way that will produce some sort of unified actor. And then whatever that actor, whoever and whatever that actor is, um, then you know, every, every, other, every other outside player can formulate policies as they wish and, and deal with it how they wish. But the situation as it stands now, where not only are Palestinians living under Israeli occupation, but they are also living with a, a deeply undemocratic and corrupt PA, um, you know, that, that is not a long-term solution for anything good. Lucy? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at, at the the question I think you pose as well about um, shrinking uh, shrinking civic space, and I think that that is a challenge. It's a challenge on uh, both sides. It's, it's a challenge. Um, within the societies, but I think that there is also still, uh, that there are, um, there are civil society organizations, um, who, who are, uh, who are still able to speak, who are still able to engage, uh, with each, uh, with each other on these questions. Um, are there smear campaigns? Absolutely. Um, but I think that these conversations, um, th th these conversations of, future looking conversations and the is what I call it the now what and what next. I mean, I think that the question that that if nothing else that Nathan and his co authors article raised is a as I understand the the impetus behind it was the this is the reality as it is. Where do we go from here? Um, and people may differ on the prescriptions. But the conversation uh, is an important one to have. And it's an important one for us to be having not just in Washington or in European capitals and elsewhere, but it's an important one for Israelis and Palestinians to be having between themselves and uh, and uh, and with each other. And I think that that's, that's an important place for us to be focusing as well, not just on this more detached policy conversation. Diane. Diane, can you hear me? Um, look, I've made my views on the Palestinian Authority very clear in the past. I, I've written about uh, that the Palestinian Authority should be folded. I'm a person who speaks very boldly about the Palestinian Authority, the need for, for elections, and so on. That said, I think it's very important to keep something in mind. It's Israel that's occupying the Palestinians, not the other way around. And therefore, it's not that we need a Palestinian authority to give Israel permission to end its occupation. Israel can do that on its very own. It doesn't need permission from anybody to do so. It doesn't need a democratic organization. It doesn't need elections. It doesn't have the will. And because it doesn't have the will, it looks to things like an undemocratic PA and all of these sorts of things. Do I believe that there should be democracy? Absolutely, because I believe that the Palestinian Authority shouldn't be the service provider that it's been turned into, but should be instead a liberation movement, which is what other liberation movements around the world have done, which is liberate us, not liberate the, their people, not manage their people. So I think we do a disservice when we're constantly focusing uh, just on the PA, and I think we really have to refocus this is a question of Israel occupying Palestine, and it's Israel's job to end the occupation. It's not the Palestinians' job to make themselves look better, to make Israel uh, feel as though it can do it. It is an obligation that it has. It must do it. And it's up to the world to, quite frankly, end this as well. Nathan. Um, thank you. You know, I, I said with regard to our article that Nobody really disagreed with the analysis. They disagreed with the prescriptions. Um, and this last round, I think everybody disagrees with on the analysis, but comes up with the same prescription. Um, and that is essentially, um, um, I wouldn't say, I won't say for more democracy uh, or for democracy per se, um, but it's for uh, democratic dialogue and democratic practice. Um, I, let me just make a quick reference on the Palestinian side, because that's been the center of, of some of the discussion. Yes, it's absolutely true that um, the, the PA is is undemocratic. I don't know how you build a democratic PA without having the right kind of political process under under un, and diplomatic process underlying it. So it's a chicken and egg issue. It's not going to happen. What you can, uh, you know, there were Palestinian elections. It wasn't just the Palestinian Authority or Palestinian leadership that 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 canceled it. Um, there was very active and intensive and successful American intervention and intervention by other countries to ensure that those elections would not be repeated. Uh, so there's there's lots of blame to go around. Um, moving uh, uh, forward, I think what is important is not to expect um, some kind of democratic Palestinian entity to suddenly 
take shape and then negotiate with Israel, or for suddenly a single state with democracy and full rights for all its inhabitants to suddenly emerge. What is important is for those people who are trying to make policy to start from the position that everybody has a voice and everybody has rights. And if policy is not starting from that basis, it's, ba it's, it's much more likely to simply more deeply entrench um, and institutionalize um, uh, what is already a deeply problematic reality. So, so democratic practice, democratic, uh, uh, um, uh, democratic dialogue, uh, greater space for discussion and debate by civil society actors, um, and perhaps you know elections can might 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 be a part of that. But but I'm talking really about a direction which politics has to take rather than any kind of uh, sudden arriving at a democratic nirvana. Thank you so much, all of you. This has been a really rich discussion. For those uh, watching that have uh, looked for uh, definite answers to how to solve the conflict, we obviously have not provided you with these. I think what we have provided today is that the two-state solution is no longer the only paradigm to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, perhaps not even the dominant one. And. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think Nathan summarized it best uh, by saying that maybe it is time today to stop uh, focusing on the shape of a solution which remains elusive and start focusing more on the rights of people, all people, Palestinians and Israelis, to have equal, right as, uh, equal rights as the basis for any solution that might come about in the future. Thank you very much for watching and uh, to be continued.